welcome to another edition of Chopper Chat and I am joined this morning by Dr Louise Park and pilot Johnny Stanton. Good to have you both with me this morning. I'm going to run with Lou actually. Mm -hmm. Yes, <laughs> so definitely. We're talking about well-being and resilience today and it's hugely important in the workplace, isn't mm -hmm. it? Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, for a long time wellness has been sort of thrown around as a bit of a, a you know, nice to have but not essential but I think it's hugely important um, and in fact I think it's sort of crucial to maintaining a sustainable and healthy workforce and one that can perform highly and also you know provide our patients with excellent care so that's what we're here for. Well if you guys are, are healthy then you're much better at doing your job well aren't you? You're so right. Mm. Yeah. You mm. have a new role then at the Rescue Helicopter Service, which is a wellbeing and resilience role. What does mm -hmm. it involve? How did it come about? Yeah, so I guess, well, my primary role is in, as, as a doctor. So I'm, a, I'm an emergency physician at Middlemore Hospital, but I also work in pre-hospital and retrieval medicine with the Auckland Rescue Helicopter. Um, I've been with the chopper now for about three years. Um, and about two years ago, I was asked to step into the role of clinical lead for wellness and resilience. Um, at that time our crews had been we'd been through a pretty tough time we'd had a series of you know pretty tough jobs and our people were really feeling it and we were really lucky at that time that we worked with an amazing clinical psychologist um, who provided us with some incredible support but we kind of identified that there was a bit of a gap in the way that we were caring for our crew so I was asked to um, to take on the role and I just kind of went from there, you know, I, I didn't have any experience in wellness and resilience or program development and so I sort of invited contribution from our crew. I really felt that it was important that they owned the program, mm -hmm. you know, so we ran some small group workshops and um, some brainstorming sessions and it just kind of grew from there. We talk a lot about, you know, wellness and resilience and mm. things, but what does that actually, what does it actually mean? Yeah, so I think there are lots of different definitions of well-being or wellness and of resilience and I think it's incredibly subjective, but I think the Māori um, well-being program definition is a beautiful way of looking at wellness because it takes into account all the different sort of pillars, all the different dimensions that make up wellness. So it talks about spirituality, emotional and psychological well-being, whānau or connection, whenua or where you're from and also physical well-being so I think that's really important to think about it that way you know and when all of those elements are in balance then a person can thrive and when they're a little bit out of balance you know a person's well-being might be you know affected and I think with regard to resilience you know the, di the dictionary definition is the ability of a substance to kind of bounce back or its elasticity and so in our context it might be the ability of our crew members to adapt and to grow following adversity and I think we've tried to create a program that kind of addresses a lot of those elements. And what in a practical sense actually happens? Do people do courses or mm. um, is it something that happens perhaps after someone's had an experience or how does it work? Yeah, so, so it's all of those things, right? We've got different, um, different levels, I think, of support. And so, for example, one of the biggest initiatives that we've developed over the past couple of years is a peer support program. So we've got a group, a small group of um, operational staff. So our crews are made up of pilots, intensive care paramedics, air crew officers and doctors. So we've got someone representing each discipline um, that still works operationally but also takes on a voluntary role as a peer supporter. So these are people that understand the challenges of the job and are able to sort of support people proactively and reactively through various challenges. So those might be challenges associated with work. So if you've gone through a really tough job um, or if you're struggling with other things in life. Yeah. I mean, I for most people, if things don't go well at their day at work, it's not a major, mm -hmm. you know, you'll get over it. For you guys dealing with life and death situations and in a helicopter, mm -hmm. I mean, there's so many elements that must make that job really quite stressful. Yeah, you're so right, you know, every day our crews are faced with people who might be living the toughest day of their life, you know. These are people that are in pain, that are sick, sometimes, you know, dying people or sometimes people that have died. And so I think that definitely takes a toll on our people. And then, you know, our jobs can be complex operational or medical jobs and, you know, remote locations subject to all kinds of elements. 
and then you throw shift work into that and I think you've got a recipe for burnout, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Tell me, um, you've got examples of when the initiatives have really worked well and you've seen success come from them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think there are various different um, initiatives within our program that have been really successful. Um, as I talked about, you know, we've got the peer support program, we've got a trainee mentoring program. We've been running some um, what we call cognitive conditioning, so optimizing performance under pressure. Um, and then other initiatives like sleep workshops and nutrition workshops, healthy food deliveries, and a really epic sponsorship deal with Cafe La Faro, who keeps us running with their coffee. But, you know, maybe Johnny Stanton, one of our pilots, can talk a little bit more on that. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so um, I'll expand a little bit on the cognitive conditioning program. Because um, like for me, I think that's one of the success stories in, in particular. Um, so we, we had uh, Dan Ford and Ken Franks, um, a couple of um, specialists come in, and they've got lots of experience in the elite sports um, programs. They've worked with, the I think, the All Blacks, but certainly the Crusaders and the Blues, uh, as well as some of the police uh, department. And um, the main role, really, or the main aim, is to to look at how individuals and teams can perform when they're under stress or under pressure. Um, so in order to do that, they would get us to do a whole lot of physical activities to get the heart rate up um, and then apply cognitive challenges. Um, and it's amazing how poor you can be at them. <laughs> so what, what are you talking about when you say cognitive challenges? Oh, What's just actually example? really simple things like um, fine motor skill um, challenges or maths equations, amazingly simple stuff. But you just can't do it when your heart's beating at 100, 180. Um, so if you can calm yourself down, breathe, prioritise, and just be aware of what's going on around you, um, both as an individual and, and as a team member, um, you can you can actually make make some pr pretty good gains if you like. Um, and I think that's well, we think that's pretty applicable to what we do when we when we're at a scene and there's a lot going on, there's a lot of people trying to um, take people's capacity away just naturally because it's so busy. Um, so in order to just remain calm and take a step back, um, yeah, I've I, I found it personally really effective and I've seen lots of my teammates um, at, you know, and a crew on, on a job, I've seen them apply it and, and make a difference here. Yeah. Isn't it interesting even just to think about what you're physically going through when you're working to that level and you're in a stressful situation to be mindful of how your body is reacting yeah. and what you need to do mm. um yeah and so you you found that it's made quite a difference do you look perhaps at jobs in the past where you think oh, we should have that knowledge yeah 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 and, um this is not particularly related to the chopper but playing a game of tennis like i i've applied it and it and um it, it works you know yeah it's um but it's the same thing like it's you know when mm. you're under under a bit of pressure or you're distracted or you you know you just you lose a bit of focus, um, which happens, it can certainly happen on a job, um, it can happen when you're flying a helicopter, um, it can happen to a crew when they're, you know, when they're working on a patient because of all the distractions. And, uh, you know, the other cool thing about our job is, is the teamwork aspect. Um, so the way I like to look at it is in a busy um, flying environment um, with lots of traffic and poor weather, might be, might be at night, um, the, the pilot or pilots up front can be working pretty hard and, and sometimes there's a fair bit of capacity in the back just to listen in and, and, and help us out, maybe prompt. Um, the same is true in a, in a really busy medical, situa medical situation. Uh, the, the crewman or the pilot might be the ones just standing back, just observing what's going on and, and they can um, potentially just um, provide just a word or two of encouragement just to refocus. Yeah, and, and that's what cognitive conditioning has taught me. Wow, it's, I mean it sounds amazing and it sounds like the, the direction that you'll be moving in is exciting too mm -hmm. um, as a team in these high pressure environments. I mean it's all of this is, you talk about tennis, but obviously it's something that I guess you do work with a lot of corporates that they could also use to take on board as well to mm -hmm. help their industries and their organisations. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think every workplace is different and the people at every workplace is di are different and the cultures are different, you know, and the, the challenges associated with every job are unique. So I think 
a well-being program is going to be different in every workplace but I think if you go into it with sort of authenticity mm. you know and if you just genuinely care about your people I think that's the main thing you know and I think every workplace can do that and I don't think it has to cost a lot you know we're a charity organization we don't have a whole lot of money to be throwing at wellness although it is I think worth it um, it doesn't doesn't have to cost a lot. Mm. What about for people who might be watching this, what tips have you got, what, or either of you, have you picked up, and I think, Johnny, you sort of shared a few already, um, when people do find themselves in a situation where they're feeling very stressed or mm. anxious, how they can kind of bring themselves back down? Yeah, I think that's something that I've been working on myself, um, and I, I haven't, you know, I haven't mastered it yet, but I think self-care is hugely important, and if you don't look after yourself, you can't look after other people and you can't give everything that you have to your workplace so I think taking a moment and it doesn't have to be much you know it can be a few moments a few minutes 10 minutes um, to breathe you know to connect with someone someone that you work with someone in your family you know to take your shoes off and walk in the grass or to just just be you know and I think it adds a huge amount of value. Mm. Johnny I mean you're a rescue helicopter pilot so in terms of cool jobs, that is right up there. Um, but I mean, it's so vitally important that you're not a gung-ho kind of person in that job. I mean, there's a huge, you have a huge responsibility on your shoulders, obviously. Um, I, I guess this sort of thing really sort of brings that all together, that importance and how important it is that you look after yourself in order for, every, for these guys to be able to look after the people you're caring for. Yeah, that, that's true, yeah. So. Um we, we just need to be consistent and I guess as, as level headed as we can be and we have our moments um, we're, we're human but um but yeah I, I like to think of the whole thing as, as teamwork um, so I think good communication and um, you know remaining predictable and just keeping it simple and um, where you can there's certainly times when there's jobs that are quite challenging from a pilot perspective um, but like, I'm not I'm not there by myself you know I'm, I'm there as a team. Um, and the other thing that's really quite amazing, a simple example if you like, is there is occasionally a, a time when we, we just can't get to a patient because of the weather. Mm. Um, and it might be um, that I'm working really hard to obviously it, to get there because that's, that's what the focus is. And it might be that Lou or one of the clinicians will just say, hey, you know, the, the patient's status four or not, or not particularly sick and there's an ambulance that's going to be there in half an hour. And it might be just a really simple comment like that that drags me back to reality. It's, it's you know, we've done our best, but we, we just can't make it this time. Yeah, those and those must be really, really difficult calls to make, but you yeah. have the safety of your crew, obviously, yeah. to consider. Mm. That's right. Mm. So in a really practical mm -hmm. sense, how are you making some of that stuff happen? When we moved to Ardmore a couple of years ago, we realised that it was a massive commute for people. You know, we have people travelling from Whangaparaua, from Matakana, you know, spending a lot of time in their cars. And our job is incredibly physical, so it was really hard for people to get to the gym or to work out, you know, during their, their shift. Um, so one of the first things we did when we moved out there, moved out there was to establish a base gym. So that's been massive, and it's in a little area that was initially designated a storage space but we've converted it into a really awesome functional workout area so it's become a little haven on base it's been a really positive addition that's fantastic mm -hmm. that's brilliant um so we what does the future look like for the program then because obviously it's 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 doing great things now where are you hoping to take it yeah, so I think um, in the two years that the program has been live we've seen some really beautiful changes arise you know we've seen a real change in the culture of the place and people are now more aware they're looking out for each other but we're still you know we're still in our infancy and we've got a long way to go I think one of the things that I would like to do is to see family and Fano included in our well in our wellness program you know I think for a lot of people family are the first line of support you know, and if we don't provide family with the tools to support our crew, then, then they can't really sort of wrap around them and, and provide them with the support that they need. We've also got a couple of other workplaces that I would like to see our wellness program extend into. So we've got our incredible crew of non-operational staff at Anzac Ave. And also following a recent merger with Northland, we've got a whole, whole new workplace up in Nest 
and I'd really like to see some of our wellness initiatives extend to make sure that we're really um, looking after them as well. That's brilliant. It's sort of it's caring for the carers. You're, exa you're exactly yeah. right. And um, you know, there's a there's a new charity organisation called Te Kiwi Maya, who I'm really lucky to sit on the advisory board for, and I'm really excited about where they're going. You know, they're an organisation that looks after frontline workers, so I'm excited to do some more work with them as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think you, you mentioned earlier on, you know, how it is one of those things that kind of gets talked about and mm -hmm. sort of companies feel like they should do it, but actually to hear about all the quite practical things that you are implementing to mm. make it happen. Yeah, you know, I, I, I genuinely believe it and I think um, an argument against wellness initiatives is that it's really hard to find the data to back it up, like yeah. to find the benefits and, and because of that it's hard to convince you know the people that are in charge of budgets that it's worthwhile mm. but you really anecdotally there must be that evidence in yeah, states right you're so right and and i think more and more evidence is coming out you know in terms of the effects it has on you know decreased staff turn up, turnover engagement reduced burnout you know like physical and and mental well-being mm. um so and for us that th is things like moving from developing ptsd to to being able to grow following trauma, so post-traumatic growth. So I just think it's massive. Yeah, and, and you talked about whānau as well, which obviously, you know, it, it's a, it, the job you do must be very challenging for your families. Um, so to provide, you know, at some point in the future, support for them so that they can better support you. I mean, it just grows, doesn't it? You're so right. And I think it's hard for our families to understand what it is that we go through, you know, and we, we often come home, I know I do, I come home and I'm just exhausted and I, I don't want to talk about it and you know I just need some time to myself and that's really hard for I think our families to understand mm. sometimes and so providing them with some insight, some understanding and some tools I think is really important. I know what you mean, like it must be kind of, are we going to be spending money on this, but mm. actually you know the, the benefit of that being at your workplace, it must be a huge you know, positive for so many people. Yeah. Um, which, like you say, when you talk about turnover and stuff like that, it's like, oh, you know, all those things make it more appealing to be there. You're mm. so right, and it's it's a whole mindset shift. You know, I think um, there were a lot of people like, oh, we can't have a gym on base because you know we can't have people working out during shift. But as long as it doesn't affect our, you know, um, our launch intervals, as long as it doesn't affect our patient care, it actually keeps us more alert, more engaged. Yes. And you know, particularly for our intensive care paramedics, you know, they're rescue swimmers, they have to be on their game physically, so it's, it's amazing, it's been hugely beneficial for us. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, well you're all so healthy, I've not yet met anyone who's not another look just so healthy, so those sorts of things are so important. We're, mm. we're working on it, I think, I think, I think we're getting there. Yeah. Well, thanks, Lou, and thank you, Johnny. Really wonderful talking to you and really, really inspiring. And we will see all of you next time for another Chopper Chat.